Well, the, the reality is there has been no debate. It has been falsehoods. And I think one, the, 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 one of the concerns I have with the current issue of looking at the Affordable Care Act and actually what is a very progressive movement and we're the last industrialized nation in the world not to have universal coverage is the fact that people make statements and then they look for facts to back them up instead of actually presenting facts and seeing what's going on. I'll give you a, a very simple example. If it wasn't for the Affordable Care Act, my son who lives in California would be on Medicaid. He's uh, graduated college, he got a job, well he's a comic and an actor, so you can see how well employed he is, so he's bartending, but they're not giving him health insurance. So who would be able to afford that for him if he got sick? That alone has insured over two and a half million Americans. Insurance companies are making off like bandits in this country, let's, let's be quite frank about it. I mean, I hope they don't drop me from, with my patient coverage, but I mean, when you have CEOs making in the nine digit figures, when you have people being denied for care, when you have hospital systems going under, when you have such a disparity in this country of health care outcomes, where for the first time in the history of America, my children's generation will not live as long as we will because of these disparities. For the first time in the history of America, my children's generation will not be as well educated as we are because we're pricing them out of education. What the hell are we doing? What are we thinking? Are we thinking just about ourselves in our pocket? Is that what's important? Is it really that important to be the richest person? Or is it more important to, to live in the best of all societies and give everybody the opportunities to be able to succeed and go somewhere? What do I think of the healthcare situation in the United States? We're almost double the next uh, per capita cost of any country in the world and we rank 33rd or 35th in health outcomes. How do I feel? I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed that we spend so much money and we're doing so poorly. I'm a gastroenterologist, let me rephrase that, that we're doing so shittily, okay? America has become a country with our technology and our scientific advances which are spectacular, where we don't let you die, but we let you suffer. Unfortunately, the work I have done has not, had, has not been that successful. I think one of the biggest failures that I can name in my career was when we built our first new Camillus clinic, which was three times the size of the old one. The fact that we had to build a clinic three times the size for a population that not, had no, no roof over their heads means as a society we had failed. The idea is to do the kind of work that we had started doing back then, and it was a group of us, in taking care of the homeless, make that obsolete. Give people the opportunity to have the lives and the futures that they want. Yeah, and it's not so much of the man dying of tuberculosis, it's also walking under the bridge when my wife was pregnant with my son who's now uh, 20, 23, going to be 24 years old next month. And she's pregnant as well as my wife being pregnant. And we're talking about the concerns we have for the future of our children. I live in Coral Gables, Florida, what I refer to as the, the city for the financially gifted. What's my concerns when I come home? Where the air conditioner is going to be? And what are her concerns? She has to live under a bridge. She's pregnant. She has another child. Is she worried about what college her children are going to go to? We don't even know they're going to get into pre-K or elementary schools because of where they are. What do you tell a child that comes into a homeless clinic, which has happened to me, to a nine-year-old girl, father's Cuban, mother was, I think, of Mexican descent. They were living in a car. And she tells me she wants to be a doctor. What a great dream. Let's be realistic. Do you really think she's going to get the study time that she needs? Who's going to help her with her SATs? Who's going to help her with her MCATs? Who's going to help finance her education? I mean, what are we doing in this nation? The reality is that what I do and what we physicians do, we take care of consequences of very poor social and public policies. Because the truth is that if you want to improve the health care of a nation, the health outcomes, the health care system has been a bit player, but it has to be there. We don't have it. It's the social and public policies that will turn around and improve the health care of a nation. It's not cutting back on education. It's investing in education. It's investing in mothers and teachers, the two most important parts of our society, so that we can develop another generation. And um, what do I think of our health care system? I wish we had one. Then we could talk about it. What we have is a very entrepreneurial spirit of making more money and the patient somewhere along the line gets lost in all of that. Well, a lot of the kids are socially aware and inspired. Many of them might be just lip service, however they are, and I think they're very altruistic when they come in. I think that also we have a system that beats them up and doesn't let them follow those sort of dreams. That's why it's sort of interesting at uh, FIU, Florida National University, where I am at now, as a proud 
Gator alumni, I'll tell you, that uh, we have the first new curriculum in medical education since 1910 from the Fleckner Report. And the Fleckner Report was a report that was written in 19, or published in 1910. He was hired in 1909 by Hopkins, Abner Fleckner, because medicine in America, and especially medical education, was too interested in money. God forbid we should be back in that stage. And that's when they, they did the report, of which was not a very good report, I might add. But it gave us the tenets of what we have today, which is two plus two, two years of basic sciences, two years of clinical. But it was a highly racist uh, document, suggesting that five of the seven black colleges, medical colleges, close. That women should not be doctors. So it's sexist, too. Uh, and then uh, we've been following that track all along. 20, 30, 40 years ago, the Brits, the, uh, the entire United Kingdom, actually, and the Canadians actually saw that you had to change that. And they put social responsibility or social accountability in the hands of the doctor. Let me tell you why. As a physician, we are socially and morally obligated to take care of everybody. First of all, you apply to medical school. Nobody says, I'm going to take care of just those that pay me. Number two, when you get into medical school in your first year, you do a thing called the white coat ceremony, where we don a white coat on you, and you take an oath, which includes the word social justice from the American Medical Association. After that, your tuition, even though it's off the wall and it has to be brought down, the maximum you're going to pay as an out-of-state student is 50 grand in tuition, but it costs about 150,000 a year to t educate you. So that means the money is being paid for by the public. Then you go on the wards to learn to be a doctor. Your first lumbar puncture, sticking a needle in somebody's back. Your first abdominal paracentesis, in essence, stabbing them in the belly or thoracentesis uh, into the lungs. I can guarantee you, it's not the CEO of a corporation. It's probably not even an executive. Chances are, it's somebody that has no insurance. And they're the ones that are training you to become physicians. Then you graduate and you take another oath. Somewhere along the line, you've done this so many times, you have an obligation. And there's nothing wrong with making a great living. As I tell the students, you want a Porsche? Great. You can help the poor a lot quicker. But, you know, the, the thing is, if you're working just for that car, if you're working just for that house, then don't come into our profession. Become a businessman. You'll make a lot more money. You won't have those outstanding loans. You don't have to be on call on the weekends. You can go sailing. But it, but it is true. In the New York Times a few weeks ago, they did come out with the profession that had the highest percentage of one percenters was medicine. It was about 20%. There's also gross disparities in the way we pay doctors. Neurosurgeons, ophthalmologists, anesthesiologists can make in the seven figures. Your primary care doctors, your internists, your family practitioners, your pediatricians, make one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars a year where those are the ones that are taking care of your whole body and your family I mean I'm still trying to figure out and please excuse me to all my dermatology friends when the hell did you have to be smart to be a dermatologist I thought you wanted the smartest one to be your primary care doctor they're the ones that are gonna keep us alive they're the ones that are gonna take care of our families but yet we put them at the bottom of the totem pole so the vending machine is wrong I'm a gastroenterologist I make a very nice living I get paid for doing procedures. I don't get paid for doing procedures correctly. I don't get paid for doing procedures appropriately or indicated. I just get paid for doing them. So when people say, no, you shouldn't change that system, I ask them, do you buy a car because they make the most? Or do you buy a car because they make the best? So we should be measured on our qualities, whether it's outcomes or whatever type of measurements are, are developed.